Shall we? That's Here it. we are. Marco? Well, we came all the way from LA for this. Shall we? I mean, of what course. kind of question? Uh, no. <laughs> que demanda? Que demanda? What's the matter, you? What's the matter, you? We could go for a coffee, rather. Than <laughs> <laughs> so we, need a, we need a coffee for sure. Yeah. I've only had three this morning. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> You're way behind. <laughs> I know. So, uh, yeah, no, it is, it's an absolute pleasure to be here in Melbourne for uh, Australia CyberCon, hosted by ASA, and uh, pleasure to meet you, Ivano. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to meet you guys. You, you're a busy, uh, busy person this week with a, oh, yeah. a few sessions. <laughs> yeah, a few. Just that one now and two more coming tomorrow. But it's it's all great. I love it. It's all good. It's all good and great to uh, great to be in in uh, Australia in the APJ region. We're gonna learn about some of the work that you do and some of the things you've been talking about this week. Uh, perhaps uh, a few words about what you're up to. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the auscert and then and, and some of the work that you're doing yeah. and, and and other things anything you want to highlight would be great of course not a problem um, so as I say thanks for for having me so my my name is Ivano Bongiovanni as as you can tell from my name and in my accent I'm I'm Italian uh, but been in Australia for a while now um, I'm currently the general manager for for auscert which is the one of the Australian um, certs computer emergency uh, response teams were actually the second oldest cert in the world after your cert, the Carnegie Mellon one mm -hmm. over in the US, the US cert. Uh, been operating for 31 years. Now I cannot claim any bragging rights or anything because I've been in the role for seven months only. <laughs> so I have just joined. Uh, and it's been an amazing seven months. Um, uh, you might not know, Ossert is closely associated with the University of Queensland mm. over in Brisbane, so we're effectively part of UQ. And I also maintain uh, um, an academic role as a, as a senior lecturer in cybersecurity at UQ. So I've got this interesting um, double role where I still get to do research, and, and, and part of what I'm talking tomorrow is based on my research. But I also have uh, this task of managing the, the OSER team and you know, trying to see what's next for, for OSER moving forward. Can I ask this question quickly? Do some of the students get to participate in, the, in, in OSERT? Do they get to yeah. be part of it, contribute to? some of the research to what the, what the team does? Yeah, um, also it is more like a, a standalone entity, if you want, within, okay. within UQ. UQ has, uh, has this big um, research center called UQ Cyber. So students typically participate in UQ Cyber. Uh, having said that, we do have uh, um, graduates that transition from um, the University of Queensland into OSERT okay. and come and work for us. So it does happen. Obviously, the, the proximity with the university uh, makes it a little bit easier to have access to talent, which is, mm. as you know very well, especially in Australia, is a big issue these days. Yeah. So we say you're a busy guy here in these days, mm. and uh, tell us a little bit about the presentation that you're having here. Yeah, so um, I'm having two presentations tomorrow. One is, is a more traditional presentation, uh, and the other one is a workshop. Uh, so in the presentation, I will be talking about a piece of research that I've done with, with my team at, at the University of Queensland on the factors that affect decision making in, in cybersecurity. Mm. Uh, the workshop will be more around uh, data governance practices. So maybe I'll say a little bit about the, the first one and then uh, yeah. about the second one as well. So the, the piece of research was um, conducted with uh, six large organizations across different um, industries. And what we did, we interviewed uh, six cyber professionals in each of those organizations. And we looked at people at the operational level, so your typical SOC analysts, uh, at the um, tactical level, which is what we define, um, you know, GRC space, or so really risk and compliance and, and, and support uh, to operations, uh, and then at the strategic level, uh, being that your CISO, um, your, your C-suite, board members, and so on. And what we asked them was to try and unpack when they make cybersecurity decisions at all of those levels, so from uh, uh, how do I configure my, my SIEM into um, am I how, how am I going to write my incident response policy, what are the contents that I'm going to put into it, uh, into shall we take cyber insurance or not, 
uh, try to figure out what are the factors that drive those decisions. When you have to, you are in the moment where you and your team have to make the decision, what are you thinking of? Because we thought that um, if we were able to map all of that out, it would be a great um, reflection tool for um, decision makers in organizations to go, hey, um, I know what the evidence is telling me. Have I looked at all the different things that could impact my decision? Have I thought of everything uh, before I made the decision? Um, so the findings were, were, quite, uh, were quite interesting from that perspective. And, and, and tomorrow's presentation is going to be mainly uh, about what those findings um, are. Um, I'm going to guess money. Uh, yeah, that's one of the big ones. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good guess. Um, possibly the uh, so we actually identified four levels of, of impacts. What happens at the industry level as an impact? What happens at the organizational level? What happens at the team level? And what does mm -hmm. happen at yeah. the individual level? So those are the four slices that we have identified. Certainly, money is a big one. That's at the organizational level. At the industry level, probably stronger than that and even more stronger is regulations right yeah. so Driver. obviously exactly uh, compliance we know that it's not perfect uh, it doesn't really drive performance but at least we, we we find out that it's a good first input for companies to do something right about their cybersecurity controls and then there's other um, interesting factors that go down to the organizational level I'm thinking of organizational culture are we risk averse or not um, down to the more individual level so things such as um, access and exposure to fora like for example ASA so access to knowledge and, and, and being part of a group of professionals that work in the same profession has a strong impact in how people make decisions because mm -hmm. obviously if you have heard somebody talk about something in their own experience especially when you don't have other evidence to make your decision uh, you can probably rely on that huh. right yeah uh, and good or bad that that can be because in some cases you know it might lead to um, suboptimal decisions uh, but but we thought that it's important to at least uh, have an understanding that that's what happens uh, in people's brain and obviously then there's there's biases because you know, at the end right. of the day we're all humans we yeah. are all uh, affected by by our biases and how make we make decisions and we need to be conscious right. of those at least so two, two questions for you on this so and we've heard reference uh, here in the last couple of days, FSISAC having a presence here, mm -hmm. which ISACs and ISOs are U.S. rooted mm -hmm. initially. Mm -hmm. Are there are there extensions here yep. from the U.S. and does Australia have their own info sharing mm -hmm. orgs? Yeah, we do. So there's a lot of ISACs uh, across Australia um, across different industries. Uh, um, one example, for for example, is in the higher education sector. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of universities. So in Australia, we have uh, uh, 43 universities, and if I'm not wrong, and there's an ISAC that is set up by an overarching body that actually facilitates uh, information exchange within uh, that specific industry. Uh, we also, um, I know that Australia is in the process of setting up a healthcare ISAC, so obviously dedicated to um, organizations that operate in that specific industry. And uh, needless to say, um, we know information sharing in cybersecurity is, is essential. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so there's a lot of work that is currently being done on trying to raise awareness on the fact that, hey, it is okay to share things such as your, your, your IOCs or, or, or uh, dynamics that you're seeing in your environment within um, certain containers where it is safe. Uh, to do so, and and even in terms of the the, um, the recent regulations, I'm thinking obviously you guys are, are, are aware of, of of the cybersecurity bill and are aware of the mm -hmm. fact that uh, there is now um, a mandate to disclose ransomware payments. Obviously, that speaks to the fact that even the regulator is saying, "Don't worry about sharing. We're not going to come after you because you have shared." Um, so. That speaks to this willingness to create safe, safe conditions for sharing. And again, I can I can speak about the higher education sector. Uh, it is a great industry from that perspective because there's this uh, willingness to really collaborate because mm -hmm. people know that you know today is me, tomorrow is you, tomorrow is you, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to kind of make sure that we are across the, the threats that we are facing. Yeah, absolutely. The second question I had um, is around data, but less about the threat and attacks and IOC and indicator of compromise and more about what's inside the organization. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I, I have a belief that there's security data that can help define a business opportunity mm -hmm. or at least unlock opportunities within the business, um, it, which is kind of at the strategic level of maybe some of the research you did. Are we starting to see where security can help define where business should focus or, and to unlock new opportunities? Have I got a couple of hours? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, come uh, back. It is, um, it is a great area of passion for me, mm what you just mentioned. Uh, and actually, it's a great segue to my second presentation, which is this workshop on data governance. Uh, my answer to your question is yes. Uh, and we actually, <laughs> and it's not just me <laughs> saying it, we heard of uh, it from, from Joe Sullivan's um, presentation. Yeah. Uh, and I, I attended a couple of other presentations where there were people saying, the amount of data that security as a function has access to is unbelievable, right? Now, data governance is a tricky one. Um, because as, as, as we say, it's not a sexy topic. It is extremely difficult to do. Uh, because, you know, for some of those larger organizations, just even knowing where your data is, who has access to it, under what conditions, and what are they doing with it, is that personal identifiable information or not? All of those questions are incredibly difficult to answer. And I do have a feeling, this is not evidence-based, but based on my conversations, I do have a feeling that it's a lot of the too hard to do basket, right? Mm. And that's why I think that there's been such a strong drive on cybersecurity investment. And, and I always use the analogy of a pyramid. By over-investing in cyber, we're really patching the top of the pyramid, but oftentimes we forget about the foundations, which is data governance. Where is the data? Who has access to it? And so on and so forth. Now, in my opinion, this, the shift is exactly what you said. Um, justifying investment in, in cyber and data governance is difficult because it is about loss prevention. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm a CEO, I don't want to spend money mm -hmm. for something that in the best case scenario doesn't lead to absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. right? I want to create value. I want more customers, I want to expand my market, I want all of those. Now, if we can shift the narrative around the fact that A, it's not just about loss prevention, it's also value creation. And an example is business intelligence, mm -hmm. right? If we can find ways to structure and structure data, we're gonna A, know where is what and who has access to it, loss prevention. But also B, understand things such as, um, are we being efficient with our operations? Uh, are there parts of our business or, or our infrastructure that, that should be decommissioned that are just costing us money in maintenance and are not delivering value? So all of those, I think, the, the second bit, I think, is a much stronger argument to go and knock at the door of the CFO and say, hey, I need investment in data governance, cybersecurity, call it as you want. I, I'm not a big fan of the concept of data governance because I think it's difficult to understand, but something along those lines. Okay. And I don't, Marco, do you remember the conversation we had with, it was a, a film company. Oh, wow, yeah. It was, it was a, a long, long time ago, but this, this was kind of the inspiration for me, where back in the day, the, the films would be captured and then physically transported from on location mm -hmm. to production and then to post production, all these things. And this organization said, if we securely find a way to do this digitally, yeah. we can change the way we change the way this business, this industry works and we'll have a first first run at mm -hmm. this new opportunity and they were very very successful with that mm -hmm. so it was a secure led by a secure method of course it's cloud and it's data storage and all that mm -hmm. um, but for me that was the inspiration of using mm -hmm. data security well to for drive me that's say what, what I was going to ask which yeah. is the use of technology and mm -hmm. how new technology comes into play in the decision making. Mm -hmm. So AI, but also kind of like a vendor driven investment, mm -hmm. right? Like the marketing, the buzz, mm -hmm. zero trust or whatever it is. And it, it does, does this become a factor in the decision making itself? Yeah, look, um, there is one thing without wanting to be too academic. There's, there's uh, a phenomenon called uh, mimetic forces in action when companies make decisions. And this is not just cyber, this is any decision. And it kicks in, in particular, when decision makers don't have enough information about where to go, if mm. they should go A mm. or B. The default approach, when you don't have enough information, is what are our competitors doing? 
follow, oh follow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, follow, follow what everybody else is yeah. doing. Mm. And look, to be honest uh, with you, in, in, in cybersecurity, considering how nascent our industry is compared to, say, HR, mm. finance, marketing, yeah. whatever, it's quite understandable, right? So vendors obviously drive a lot of that because one vendor has, has exposure to a number of other organizations. So they do know what the different organizations are doing. And uh, they are actually able to replicate some of those things across the different organizations. So a lot of times companies um, approach vendors and, and, and ask the question, hey, w what are you seeing in my industry? Mm -hmm. And what is best practices? The problem with cyber is that defining what best practice is, is incredibly challenging. And if that is missing, people just try to look at what everybody else is doing. Hopefully you can get a little bit higher than what the average is. Um, but again, it's, it's not perfect. It is what it is at this stage. And you mentioned two, two other, well, I'll call them service categories, HR and, and marketing. To me, those are two industries, whatever you want to call them, that have really dialed up. Mm -hmm. If we understand our employees really, really well, use all that data we have about them, we can keep them productive, we can keep them healthy, we can get the most out of them as a resource. Same for marketing. Mm -hmm. If we dial that up, we use all our sales and marketing data, we can get the best leads to the sales, to the, right, the renewals, and that. it's all data driven. Mm -hmm. So I, I, again, I have this view that that security data exists mm -hmm. where we can do that same kind of dial up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if executive teams are ready for that. Sounds like maybe they are. Well, I mean, there's, there's more and more um, CDOs positions mm -hmm. being that chief data officer or chief digital officer, mm -hmm. right, created. Now, there was a big drive a couple of years ago. Um, it hasn't really been um, up to speed as much, and I don't really know why. But if you think about it, when you blend together loss prevention and value creation, as mm -hmm. we said before, and just boil it down to, as you said, data, it makes a lot of sense to have a CDO that does a little bit of both. Now, you also don't want a half cook, loss prevention and value creation. So, you know, I is there something that different parties need to do? So, you want to strengthen your loss prevention, well, you're going to give a task to the CEO and the CRO, if you have a chief risk officer, right? Or, or somebody else in that mm -hmm. type of role. Um, it, is, uh, it, it is still a lot of, you know, ongoing conversation, but I agree with you. At the end of the day, you boil it down to data, and then you decide where you want to go. Yeah. Anything that, that inspired you in these days that you were here? You say you saw Joe Sullivan. We yeah. Got, we got to talk to him. We're actually in the same hotel, so we get to run <laughs> into him too. <laughs> He's a great guy. We, we had him on the show a few times, and we, we know the story he went through. But yeah. we thought uh, we, we heard some feedback of his presentation. Yeah. How I'm pretty sure everybody was excited about it. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you think about it? I was, I was, I was uh, very, very happy and it was incredibly inspiring. So I shared that kind of feedback. I think uh, he was able to show the power of storytelling. Yeah. Uh, and I believe there is actually a couple of presentations on storytelling in cybersecurity, which is another interesting um, perspective that is not very common in, mm -hmm. in the cyber industry. So incredibly inspiring. Uh, I kind of, um, you know, looked at, um, it, it was good to f for him to boil down his experience and then translate it in actions, actions for people. Yeah. And, and I saw um, a lot of people leaving the room really thinking about what they just uh, um, taken part of because it was incredibly mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah, And you know, in general, the this is a great conference. Um, that there's a lot going on, obviously, as, as all of these big conferences. Uh, I think uh, speaking with people, everybody loves the, the networking side of, of it, yeah. where in three days you can really get to meet a lot of people, have, have exciting conversations. I finally managed to see people in person that I've never seen in my life, other than Zoom or Teams. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, always a plus. It's, it's great, yeah. yeah. I haven't had a chance to ask this question yet, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you first. Okay. And it's related to You're Joe. Lucky. I'm really lucky, I don't know. <laughs> related to <laughs> Joe's <laughs> experience, we have a good friend, Tim Brown, who's also experienced some challenges in the U.S. in, in the CISO role. Mm. And the uh, reason I'm going to ask you this the question is because of the, the, uh, the new cyber law with the uh, reporting. Mm. kind of gives a, a safe, it, it enters the idea that there's a safe space to mm -hmm. share, yep. right, as you described. So my question is, in Australia, and I don't know if you have a view outside of Australia, 
the, the role of the CISO. In the, in the U.S., there's a lot of pressure, and now even some legal pressure as well. Um, how do you see the CISO role in Australia in, in that regard? Mm. Well, as you probably know, we're always a little bit behind what happens in the U.S., so we try to um, play catch up. But what happens in the U.S. is a reasonable predictor of what's going to happen um, over in Australia. Now, I was um, um, quite surprised, to be honest. Uh, one of the topics I've been working on is um, board members' uh, liability in case of cyber security uh, and data breaches. And as you probably know, I think it was March 2023, I believe, uh, SEC proposed a piece of legislation that would actually um, closely connect um, CISOs, uh, sorry, uh, board members' actions with potential liability in case of data breaches. Now, that law was pushed back. It didn't go through. Uh, there's still obviously, you know, uh, instances uh, where where uh, there could be personal liability for board directors in case of uh, of, uh, of a data breach. And the idea was uh, more about having board members disclose what cybersecurity competencies and skills they have, because that's the assumption is that, well, if they do know something about, about cyber, um, investors are going to be a little bit more um, happy to invest in that specific company because of data breach, you know, might, obviously might still happen, but you're going to have a, that top leadership buy-in that is very much um, necessary. Uh, now, all of that to say that we actually, so, so some of the comments were in, in the US where, well, um, board members have actually been let off the hook uh, with, with this change in cybersecurity regulation. And, and again, I think the, the more sophisticated comment on that was that that's not exactly true. What has been uh, growing is more burden on CISOs to produce the evidence for the directors that they're actually doing as a company mm -hmm. the right things when it comes to cybersecurity. And in, in Australia, we're seeing the same, uh, okay. the same dynamic. So it is. It is. It is. It, it is, is a squeeze. Yeah. It is a squeeze. And ASIC in Australia, yeah. the, the regulator in that case. It's the SEC equivalent, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, has already, um, yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah, because they do, they deal with uh, with investment as yeah. well. So they have already said that, you know, they're going to they're gonna hold um, board members accountable. Now, there is no specific regulation that connects cybersecurity responsibility and personal liability with board members. In Australia, everything boils down to the Corporations Act that says that board members have to act uh, with um, duty of care and diligence. Obviously, if it emerges from investigation that the company has not invested enough in cybersecurity, we're, we're um, negligent in cybersecurity practices, that could, you know, kick in this clause of your know, duty of care and diligence because board members probably have not um, performed with, within this duty of care and diligence. So all of this long explanation to say <laughs> we're saying similar dynamics, uh, right. things are squeezing in, uh, board members and, and top leaders in general have to be more accountable. They're going to become more demanding towards sizes, which is going to increase the pressure on sizes. Yeah. Hmm. Another reason not to be a size. No, I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, See, we reason that. number one. There's a reason I'm not a size. There's a reason I'm not a size. So I have tremendous respect for them. 100% same. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it, I think it comes down to the fact that it's very complicated and it's, mm. as you said, and as we know, it's a, we expect to be a mature industry. We talk about maturity all the mm -hmm. time, but it's a young industry. We're it still is. figuring out as we go. I mean, what, what about the responsibility of the vendor? Mm. Oh, yeah. No, they're off the hook. I mean, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> so no liability on that. We saw a few things yeah. happen in, in the recent, uh, oh, yeah. the recent months. Yeah. Well, well and, and third party risk, just, just to finish off, yeah. is yeah. another massive topic here in yeah. Australia. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Maybe we can have a chat on that separately. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you are definitely welcome to join us besides uh, the, the regional event here, which we're happy to be, and uh, hopefully mm -hmm. we'll be back next year. I'll, I'll, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> of course. Uh, and then, of course, you can, you is can, always good. Right? Yeah, right. and exactly. you can enjoy. You can join us on one of our online episodes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. On redefining cybersecurity with Sean, I'll be part of it too. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Thanks super for fun. Really, super really, informative. Really great conversation. Yeah. Absolutely appreciate it. Yeah. My, my pleasure. Yep. And enjoy uh, the rest of the conference. Thank you thank so much. You. Um, and uh, for everybody watching, you can get in touch uh, with a any of our guests just by checking out all the podcasts that we've been publishing. 
there is way many more where this <laughs> came from because we're still in this room for <laughs> for a while. <laughs> it looks like couple. separate episodes to use one long episode. For <laughs> exactly, but we, we will be filming on outside yeah. in the yes. in the in the center uh, expo center as well. So stay tuned, subscribe, and we got many more coming. Uh, I don't know how many. I don't Ten. Know. I think 10 from today, All something right. something like that. So All right. Let's right. go. Fantastic having you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. ThreatLocker is a zero trust endpoint protection platform providing enterprise level cybersecurity to organizations globally. With ThreatLocker, you only allow only what you need and block everything else, including ransomware. Learn more at threatlocker.com.